Why are fewer and fewer students choosing careers in science? This week on Second Nature, I'll pose that very question to our country's top scientists as we speak to him live in his tiny basement bachelor apartment. You know, I live up here in orbit, far above the clouds and the wind and the rain. But this week, I feel under the weather. My computer Nancy caught a virus, and now my discs are inflamed. And you think you have trouble finding a doctor who makes house calls. Anyway, this week, I've booked an appointment to look at the future of medicine and medicine of the future. Anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe has a vote and the English only sign. 40,000 tons of Born with PCBs blew up the ozone layer today. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Greetings, prisoners of gravity. This is Commander Rick. My grandmother always said, money is meaningless if you don't have your health. Of course, Granny never read Frederick Pohl's novel, Gateway. In this Hugo and Nebula Award winner, people dream of earning incredible wealth by becoming space prospectors for the Gateway Corporation. But just paying the astronomical fare to the Gateway asteroid can cost you an arm and a leg, or more. The uh, whole thing about the Gateway Asteroid, where these people get into their ships and go off and explore the universe and prospect for uh, treasures of one kind or another, is that in order to get there, you have to be able to pay your way. In the case of the family called the Forehands, the way they got there was that they had several children and a mother and father, and they, one of the children sold his body parts for transplants to raise money for the rest of them to go to Gateway. And I do think that that's rather plausible, too. Uh, there is already a black market in body parts in some parts of the world. I don't know how widespread it is, but it is said that uh, people have been kidnapped and killed uh, for the sake of a liver or a pancreas or whatever. Uh, and I think that that probably is true, and I think it's likely to become more and more true as the ability to do working transplants uh, gets improved all around the world. A couple of thousand bucks for both your legs? Talk about selling yourself short. The idea of a black market in human organs was first explored in Larry Niven's short story, The Organ Leggers, written a couple of years after the first human heart transplant in 1967. In Larry's collection, The Long Arm of Gil Hamilton, he even imagined convicted criminals being sentenced to surgery to be sliced up for parts for people who deserve to live. Instead of the electric chair, it's the operating table. Another author who's repeatedly returned to medical themes in her fiction is Nancy Cress. And like Frederick Pohl, she knows the challenge facing future physicians won't be, can we rebuild his foot, but who's footing his bill? In Nancy's wonderfully poignant story, The Mountain to Muhammad, American society has been split into two groups, the hale and hearty who qualify for health insurance coverage and the uninsurables. After Dr. Jesse Randall is tricked into botching a simple operation on an uninsurable girl, he's kicked out of the medical establishment. And then he finds his true calling. Nancy, what prompted you to write The Mountain to Muhammad? The growing concern over insurance. I have two relatives who are walking around without health insurance because they can't afford it. And of course, there are science fiction writers, we all know, who can't get insurance because they have chronic conditions and therefore are uninsurable. And as the technology advances to the point where we can identify these potentially chronic conditions even before they manifest themselves, before they become chronic conditions, insurance companies will have 
even more tools for refining their bedding, which essentially is what insurance is, by removing those people that are going to cost them a lot of money and keeping those people that are not going to cost them all that much money so that they can make a profit. But this is, this is treating people the same way you do numbers on a roulette wheel when you have some inside odds as to whether it's going to come up red or black. And it seems to me there's something ethically wrong with that. But with the spiraling costs of high-tech health care, are people expecting too much from the health insurance system? I mean, if we want affordable medicine, what restrictions should we be prepared to accept? I think we have to accept the limits of medicine and the limits of affordable medicine. And that can be very hard when it's you or it's a loved one. One of the areas, though, that I think we need to do that is in terms of the dying. If I'm dying, I don't want to be kept alive by large amounts of technology very long. That's a personal choice, and I know that other people disagree. But it's also a choice that diverts medical care from those people who might benefit from it. Right. Another example is very premature babies, like, say, a baby that weighs a pound and a half. We can keep such children alive. It can cost up to a million dollars. Is that the best use of this million dollars? And I don't know. Maybe it is. But if it means that other children who don't have, whose parents can't pay for that kind of insurance coverage or that kind of direct care, who need a much simpler operation that costs $10,000 to keep them alive for a long time, how do you count the value of how many operations worth $10,000 you could, you could do to save one preemie that's going to cost up to a million? And, and I don't pretend to have the answers, but what I do think is that we're not looking at the questions. Right. Now, in your story, people are denied health coverage because genetic scanning warns the insurance companies which customers are susceptible to cancer or other deadly diseases. How close are we to that sort of gene scan technology now? Well, again, my, my background is not in science, but from what I read in the popular press, we have developed techniques that can identify certain genetic deficiencies like Huntington's disease only from a gene scan before such diseases manifest themselves in the individual. And what, what is scary about this is that what the gene shows is a, pre -ten is a tendency to develop it, but it doesn't say you absolutely will. I could be walking around right now with a tendency to diabetes and never get diabetes. But if my insurance company only were to examine my genes and discover the that the gene for diabetes is there and deny me insurance coverage on the basis of something that I might never get. We're very close to that for some diseases, not for a full range of it, but for some of them. More and more links between genes and specific diseases are being made these days thanks to the Human Genome Project. This inner space program is a huge international effort to completely map the human genetic code at an estimated cost of three billion dollars over 15 years. Mapping the Code is a behind-the-scenes look at the Human Genome Project by author Joel Davis. Joel, it's Commander Rick. How will the Human Genome Project change the way medicine will be practiced in the future? It's already changing the way medicine is practiced now, and it's going to change the way medicine is practiced in the future uh, even more radically. We're already seeing the first experiments in the United States using uh, genetic engineering techniques to to cure diseases and to come up with different treatments for diseases. As we find out what genes cause specific genetically caused diseases, we're going to eventually be able to use that information to create uh, cures for those diseases, treatments for those diseases, and then of course the next step from that will be taking things like special viruses and genetically engineering them to introduce them into the human body to eliminate bad genes and replace them with the, the correct uh, forms of a faulty gene, curing diseases like multiple sclerosis or cystic fibrosis, retinitis pigmentosa, uh, Huntington's disease, things like that. Uh, it's going to radically change the way medicine is done. Now, because the Genome Project is unfolding in small labs all around the world and it's costing mega bucks, I'd imagine a lot of people want a slice of any profits. Who's going to end up owning the drugs developed from human DNA? 